I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners across the country where the program is broadcast, particularly the local traditional owners, the Jagara, Yagara, Turupal and Yungarapal peoples, the Yugambe, Mananjali, Kombameri, Nuna, Wandamuka peoples. I'd also like to acknowledge elders, elders of the first peoples of the land and elders of more recent arrivals. Welcome to each and every one of you. And welcome to all our listeners, tuned in across the country by the National Indigenous Radio Service and across the world by the World Wide Web. Welcome to you. It's great to have your company. My guests are live in the studio, joining me. Linda Mason, a multi-award winning photographer, is joining me in the studio with her son, Liam. Now, Belinda won the richest photography prize in Australia back in 08 for an image titled Four Generations. She won the Human Rights Award for Photography for images from Yulnuan Balanda, and we're going to talk about that one today. That was in 2008. She has been invited to speak at numerous festivals in 02, the Melbourne Arts Festival, 04, the International Festival of Photography, Sydney, in 07, the Australian Centre of Photography. In 010, the Blowfish AIPP, we'll get put into to tell us what that is in a while, Blowfish AIPP conference in Sydney. And uh, she won an award for most emotionally intense image. 2008 at Perth PCP, an international award. So we've got quite a prestigious Australian photographer here in the studios today. Belinda, how are you? I'm good. Honestly. I'm very nervous. <laughs> of course, right, that, that's what I'm waiting for here. Yeah. Liam, how about you, mate? You're not half as nervous. You're sitting back like you've done it a thousand times. How are you, lad? I'm good, sir. You're good? How old are you? I'm 16. You're 16. You work with your brother, um, Dieter, who was older than you, 18-year-old, Dieter. Uh, you and your brother work with your mum. Um, doing. Tell us what you do when you go out with your mum. Um, so my mum is working on a couple projects, uh, well, has been working on projects for all our lives, basically. So we've been shown a lot of different aspects of the world at young ages. Um, generally, me and Dita have just tagged along, not really working on anything. Um, just, you know, basically carrying around Carrying bags, yeah. yeah. carrying bags. Mm. Um, but I guess starting from this year, uh, me and Dita have actually started working with our mum to create larger pieces of work. So we, because my mum doesn't do interviewing and I love interviewing people, um, trying to be a journalist when I'm older, um, I guess we've created a system where we work together um, and make these pieces come to life so you get to understand a further story of the artwork. And Dieter, what's his role? Um, Dieter takes photographs during the interview, um, so he will um, take a number of photos just as the person is moving around, moving their hands, and film it at the same time. Um, then he'll put it then we'll put my interview with the footage and um, we'll create a small little piece about it, which then can be looked on the internet or um, any other. So you create digital stories. Yeah. It's not movies that he's shooting because he's shooting image. You're getting the audio and you just run the image and run the audio over the image. Yeah. Digital stories. It's fantastic, right? It's, a, it's great to see young fellows like you guys. Um, I must uh, emphasise these young fellas are of the settler society, um, but I can get uh, white fella, white Australians, or other Australians, as we call people, you know. Um, but there's many different names. Belinda, as uh, as you know, Belinda. But Belinda, welcome to the program. How are you? Good? A little bit less nervous. Okay, you? there you go. You settle down, woman. You're right. You know, there's no problem. It's all cool. It's just a casual chat. There might be two or three people. There must be family that listen. Nobody else listens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Nobody else listens. Oh, no, don't, don't tell me. I know how many people <laughs> listen, and that's scary. <laughs> You've, your dad was uh, is of German origins and did some travel around with you as a young child around the country. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's probably what made me um, uh, just want to stay in contact with the broader part of Australia. He he didn't have any he didn't have any um, money because he was an immigrant, and so he built a four wheel drive out of the chassis of a a Volkswagen and then got a pot rivet gun and sheets of aluminium and just made this car. And um, my mum was a teacher aide and she used to get time off from the education department to 
homeschool us on these trips and we travelled on all the dirt roads all across, um, all across Australia. It was absolutely fantastic childhood. And you met First Nations people in those travels as a young child? Uh, yes, yes, I did through, through Alice. I remember Alice, what I remember of it is I remember Alice Springs and I remember travelling across the Malabar and the communities there. And that was sort of, you know, and when you look at the, the, um, the time frame of that, um, we're going there next. We're going to see Uncle Yummy Lester next. So that'll bring me back right into, right into my childhood and where all the trips, and it's wonderful to be able to take Dieter and Liam along with me this time and they'll actually see part of what my childhood was. Well, when you're talking to him, Liam, you let him know that you sat in the studios with me here. He's been on the phone and we've been, we've been mates for a long time. So I pass my regards. He's a wonderful old man, that man. All right, and now you're doing similar with your boys as to what you did, to your dad did with you. You travel with your dad, your boys are travelling with you, but they're, um, they're certainly doing quite a job. Fantastic to see Liam doing the interviews. And I saw him in action yesterday. And then uh, young Dieter, who's had to go back uh, for schooling purposes on the plane yesterday. Um, it's just great to see these young fellows um, making more of a team with yourself. I mean... Even though you've won so many awards and things, there's so much more to what you're doing now, having these boys in their roles. How do you feel about it? I, I think it's wonderful. First of all, I think the reason why I used to bring them along was when they were there and I couldn't, they were so little, I didn't know what to do with them except for bring them. And um, I remember, you know, sometimes they'd be there for quite difficult or controversial photographs and having to explain to them the reasons why I was doing a photograph and what it meant and why it was important to the person. And um, then I noticed how much it changed their lives and made their perceptions of the world broader. And, um, and that probably is one of the biggest driving forces, the, the ability to show them such an such a incredible viewpoint of the world and, and so many viewpoints and the diversity of the, of the people in our community and how rich that makes our community. Liam, how do you feel about it? I mean, did you miss out on some school or did you just uh, go on school holidays? And the broadening of that, of that educational experience, I mean, you're probably learning equally as much, if not more, valuable lessons and more about life, being out and travelling with your mum than you did in, in, in school. But it's a good balance. They complement each other, I imagine. What's it mean to you? Well, you're definitely right there. Um, one, it's the last week of school, so I'm not going to really be learning anything at all besides, you know, how cinema photography works in movies, I guess, um, if that. Um, but in general, whenever I go up to any community or any photo shoot of my mum's, really, um, I think it teaches me a whole lot more than school could ever really teach me. Um, you can never really learn about someone's culture from a book, I think. I mean, it can give you facts, but you never get that that depth that you would get with someone else. You never get the stories um, that you hear from someone. It's not the same. Um, a teacher trying to explain to you how Aboriginal culture is when they've never experienced it, it's, it's not hypocritical, but it's just naive. And um, I just find that when I go up to these communities, it's just so much better. And there's no way that it could be replaced by it simple week of education. You've been out to Arakoon, for example, one of my favourite communities. You've got some good brothers up there, good family up there. Been there? Uh, yeah, I went up to Arakoon um, with my brother and we are, uh, well, my brother and I teach um, filmmaking to um, young people with um, mental, uh, with psychological disabilities. Um, it, was, it was hard at first, um, but in the end we found people that could really shine, and it was definitely worth it in the end. And it, it was a learning experience for me and my brother, and my mum went up with us too to help us out as well. Um, it was just this, it was incredible just to, I had to learn how to teach, and I had to learn how to, I learned so much from their culture, but they also learned a lot from me, I guess, as well. And in, we worked together a lot, which I found was incredible. Two-way learning. It doesn't, it doesn't happen a lot in those situations. Generally, the teacher sits out the front and uh, is, is the authority and, uh, 
and you sit there and learn. You, know, the, the, you don't often see the presenter or the teacher learning in those formal sort of senses, but uh, it's great that you can see that and experience, and experience that, the two-way learning. Belinda, you're in town at the moment on a project called Yungu on Balinda. That's right. Tell us about it. Well, let me just explain first for those of our listeners that may not understand. Yungu is uh, the, the word for us blackfellas up in the territory there in Arnhem Land and stuff. And Balinda is a term for white men across the ter largely across the territory. Um, Balinda is used as a, uh, to refer to white men. As here in Queensland, or in this part of the, of the state, we say uh, Murray and Migloo. And that's where the white whale Migloo got his name. It was Murray that gave him that name, um, because he's white, he's a Migloo. So we say Murray and Migloo in the Territory, it's Yungu and Bolna. And uh, Belinda will tell us about this photographic exhibition of Yungu and Bolna. When I, when I won the Moran, I thought I'd take the opportunity to um, uh, do some of the teaching that they allow. And so um, I went up with um, uh, Uncle Merv Bishop and we travelled from Maningrida to Ramanginning, Yakala and Nullumboy. And Maningrida's actually got a really special place in my heart because I have a very dear friend. He passed away in 2006. And, um, uh, and, but I've continued the story with his son. And um, so he came along on that trip. I got funding for him to actual tra actually travel with us as a translator and to be that advisor in that process. And, um, and also I got to teach him photography. So he's actually been in some exhibitions in um, Perth and in Queensland, and actually in Barcelona as well with the work that he's, he's been doing. And we decided to get a, uh, a whiteboard and a black texter and have um, black on white, um, because you often hear the voices of, oh, it's so common, white people love to tell about what they think and how they th and it's, um, uh, and it's overrun and overwhelmed by the voices that are from the community themselves, the Aboriginal people. So I said, to, I, I just said, um, it was the anniversary of the intervention policy, and so I wanted to capture those voices. And it was only 12 months later, and there was, it was whether it was going to go ahead or not, 12 months later, and it did. And so it was the response to that. And they wrote about how they felt. And, I, and um, Blake wrote, um, our laws have been the same for thousands of years and yours change whenever you want. And I think in the Territory that really encompassed um, the feeling there, the, the lack of control over those decisions and the lack of input. And um, so it was a very powerful, strong, strong image. And then um, I got asked to, to exhibit it in Western Australia and I thought, well, I can't go to Western Australia and, and not include people from Western Australia. So I found a contact up in Broome, Robert Dan, wonderful bloke. And um, he took me around uh, Broome and into Beagle Bay and we did the same project, but the question sort of altered. It was, what would you like to say? And it's, it's quite confronting when, um, as, a, as a white person, you're asking that question. What, what message do you want me to take back to a city? If this appears on a wall and the majority of people that come are going to be white, what do you want to tell them? This is, this is a voice that you can, you can have. And whether that, you know, doesn't mean that everybody wants to do it. But when they do, they look and they sometimes you can you you can sort of see on their face an expression that um, uh, they uh, oh you know they they'd really like to say something in particular, um, but they don't. And then they rethink and they say, okay, well I could just say that you know those simple two words, and then it's like well you know there's a bit more to it than that. You know you can broaden it out and and put your point across, and then they sit and they say, I don't know what to write. And I say, just, all right, well, and I'll just walk away and I come back and there's an essay. <laughs> or there's just one line that's extraordinary. Mm. So, and there's over 100 people from across Australia. So I went to, um, um, the exhibition was shown in Albury, um, which is a fantastic regional gallery, really progressive. The quality of the, the um, exhibitions that they, that they have there is, um, is fantastic. And it was wonderful to actually be a part of it. And they own another series of um, images in their collection that I did on sexuality and disability. Um, so it got to go to Albury and then of course um, went down, I went down to Melbourne and collected more voices. I've just been to Canberra and I'm, I'm here in Brisbane. Collecting more voices for this exhibition? I, I hope so. So it seems, it, it seems to just expand, grow and grow. Yes, yes. But how does that work in with the actual displaying? Um, 
the expansion, the growth? I mean, how do you determine? Do you, do you take out some of the old and then replace it with new? Or is it just no. the original concept and it's growing and growing and getting bigger? The original concept's just grown. So it's it hasn't always been possible to take Dieter and Liam on all of those trips, um, only because it's expensive. And um, But when I do get the chance, then those voices are recorded. And, um, you know... We'd all love to have that ideal world of having every single one of those people's voices recorded. Um, but we'll, we'll be the opportunity to show the recordings, um, at the, visual, the visual ones that have been done as well as just the audio ones. Um, and so there'll be a selection of images that... I think it's best when you, when you exhibit in a community to give the community the voice and then the, the images that, dis, um, that appear on a... Um, on a screen uh, like a slideshow or, or on a television as, as footage uh, are definitely a part so you can see a part of the exhibition so that everybody can see the voices strong across Australia um, and the primary focus is the people from that community so their images will appear as the, the bold um, centrepiece of, of each city. So people can you'd like to hear from people if they want if they want to in, be involved or be engaged. Yes, I'd, in I'd this love project. to hear. Yes. Yeah? Yes. How long are you in Brisbane Paul? I'm just here for today. All right, okay. So if there's any uh, First Nations people out there that would uh, like to engage, they can uh, call you? Yep. What's your number? 0414 787 788. Oh, that, was, that was nice and slow. It was, <laughs> it was. Yes, and we'll tell the number again. Uh, so if anybody does want to, you might find somebody around here that might want to do it too. Tell us about this project, Unfinished Business. Um, Unfinished Business is a, is a new project that I'm working on, and that's, that's also why I've come to Brisbane. Um, uh, I, uh, from the work that I did on sexuality and disability, I, I became close friends to a man called Tom Shakespeare who lives over in the UK, and he has um, short stature. Um, and, uh, and he asked me... He works at the World Health at the moment, and he asked me to take a photograph that captured disability in Australia. And I said to him, well, look, if, if you're going to do disability in Australia, there is only one topic that you need to, to cover, and that is disability in the Aboriginal communities. And he said, wonderful, OK, well, you find your story. So um, I uh, got in contact with um, Uncle Lester Bostock and asked him whether he would be the person who would be interviewed for the World Health and be photographed. And, and now, he, Lester's role is? Lester What's is, his title? He is the um, chairman of the First People's Disability Network, which was just, a, at the time, was just just forming because it was in, I think, I may have this wrong, um, it, I only know about the, of course, the New South Wales branch, and I was dealing with Damien Griffith in that, um, in that forum. And so I know that the First People's Disability Network's been going about, it must be 12, it must be 12 months now. And that's because of the growth and demand in the community for these services. Um, and I sent the photograph to um, Tom and he said, you know what, you really should, you should keep on going here. So I went back to um, Uncle Lester and Damien and, um, and said, let's do this. And, um, and they're very, very busy with everything that they're doing. And so I just kept there, you know, every now and again going and seeing them, we should do this um, for about 18 months. And... Um, and then, you know, built a framework for it so it, would, um, so it would be possible. And then they had a board meeting and discussed it all. And then three weeks ago, they said, let's do it. So um, Tom is uh, trying to help us get the work exhibited at the United Nations in Geneva um, in September next year when there's going to be a big forum on Indigenous um, disability because the First People's Disability Network is the only disability um, organisation in the world that focuses purely on Indigenous uh, disability. So they, um, they really are a, an incredible organisation for the work that they're doing, and it really is a piece of unfinished business that needs a lot of attention drawn to it so that, so that conditions and situations can be highlighted and the voices of these people can be heard. And this gives me that opportunity to help them do that, and it gives me the opportunity to show my boys another world. Certainly is another world. Um, disabilities in the first, within the First Nations communities 
is, I don't know how many times higher than mainstream Australia, but it is considerably higher. Um, life's, there's enough disadvantage, as if there's not enough disadvantage within the First Nations community without a, without a disability. Where there's disability, it's multiple disadvantage. Um, and there could be out in Arakoon. I mean, I went to Murujulu a couple of years ago and I saw a number of people in wheelchairs. It might only have been three, but it's only a small community, 300 people or so. And I see three or four people in, in wheelchairs. Um, and th th that sort of thing strikes you now to be in Mutujulu, which is at the base of Uluru, in a wheelchair. I mean, it's uh, it's going to be tough going, tough going, in that such isolation and, and the heat and, and and stuff like that. So these services of First Nations people have been establishing along the way. Uh, it's just great to see the First Peoples um, Disability Service with. This particular one, uh, I suppose there's a diverse range of disability that you photograph. Tell us just some of them. Um, well, you know, of course, um, uh, of course, it's it is very broad. So you've got you've got disabilities that are visible and non-invisible. You've got congenital and acquired. There's the sensory disabilities. There's the psychiatric um, uh, brain injury. And um, an intellectual, which are three, they're, they're three um, disabilities that just incorporate the brain. So, so the the, cro the broad cross range is really, really critical in the work. And um, uh, and so I'm I'm travelling next to um, uh, photograph Jandama, who was burnt um, when he was six, and then I go to um, uh, South Australia to photograph um, Auntie Gail Rankin. Who I grew up with her sister as a teenager. I grew up with her, her sister, Karen, and so we're very close. And um, and it's wonderful to be able to photograph her because that to photograph Gail because that gives me that connection, that personal connection into the into the exhibition, um, which is very very important to me. And um, just like Blake um, was important for the um, Younger Lauren Ballander exhibition. Then we go up to photograph Uncle Yami Lester and then across um, to photograph a very unique, not a, actually, unfortunately, it's not a unique story. But um, I asked um, Uncle Lester if I could touch nerves or how far he wanted me to be able to go, like wh where were my boundaries on what I could do? And they said, you touch as many nerves as you like. So I'm going over to photograph Marlon N Noble, who was um, incarcerated for 10 years without charge. He has an intellectual disability, and um, which was acquired through meningitis as a child. And he's a um, uh, he's an extraordinary young man who just wants his name cleared. He and likes to ride a motorbike, I understand. Mm. Yeah, yeah. He's an extraordinary young man, and only just recently released. I yes. mean, his his story has just been told in mainstream media just in the last six months or so. Yes. And it's great to see that story being told. All right. Unfinished Business. We've got a song uh, called Unfinished Business. We might just play that and continue our chat. My guests are uh, Belinda Mason and Liam Mason, mother and son, um, photographers and uh, aspiring journalists, young Liam, doing interviews and things, talking about a range of uh, communities and exhibitions that help expose the, uh, the situation with First Nations people. Here's Mundi and Turner, or is that Mundi and Turner? It might be Mundi and Turner? No, it's Mundi and Turner, yeah, right. Yeah. Mundi and Turner with unfinished business. Yes, been getting away with it for too long. That's what's been happening in this country we all call home. Aboriginal land, more commonly known as Australia, I suppose. But yes, there's a lot of unfinished business, no question about that. And it's good to see people like, uh, like, like Belinda Mason facilitating the stories being told, facilitating those experiences um, being exposed to mainstream Australia. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important role, an important job. And it's great to see you doing that with the Neerum brothers, the sons, the boys, Liam and uh, Dieter, are known as the Neerum brothers. And uh, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty talented young fellas. 
they're quite near them, the whole project, Yarraka, aren't they? Yarraka's in here with me. Um, Yarraka's in here because she wants the big notice. No, she's not really on the big notice, help. But she's here because she's been a part. She's been asked by Belinda to bring along my little grandson, Quaden, for uh, to be involved in unfinished business. And um, he's probably got some unfinished business where he's unable to grow anymore. He's got unfinished business. Uh, Quaden, my grandson, is a uh, he suffers from or has a contraplasia. It's a form, one of the many forms of dwarfism. And Belinda, is he the first little person? That you photographed in un as a part of unfinished business. Yeah, he, he's the first um, uh, little person, and um, he'll be the only little person. All oh, right, he's going to hold the spotlight on his own in that regard. Absolutely, um, he, but he's not the uh, first short stature person I've photographed. You were saying the other man in the UK. Yes, uh, uh, Tom Shakespeare. Tom Shakespeare, yes. Yeah. And um, and I also photographed a lady down in Melbourne who's called Margarita Coppolino. And um, I'm mentoring her at the moment because she um, uh, uh, wants to be a photographer. And then an extraordinary girl um, called Brittany uh, who plays um, basketball for the, uh, for the Paralympic team. So there's, there's an incredible community out there and, and to highlight that is, is really important and Quaden gives the opportunity to highlight the positive community that, that um, he's going to grow into. Mm, okay. How did you become aware of Quaden? Ah, that's a... That was really interesting. I got asked to do a commission job, just a normal sort of standard job for the Human Rights Commission, and they were looking for models. And um, so I put a notice up in the Redfern Community Centre looking for models, and um, someone said, hey, you should get... There's this girl called Binui, so you should um, get her. And so I rang and met her, and, um, and she and her son were both in the photographs. And they were, they were actually quite... They were very good, sort of... It was about... Um, uh, she's a she's a businesswoman in a meeting room talking, and that's the photograph. And we were in the car talking as I was driving her um, home, and she said, "Oh, you know what else do you do?" And I said, "Oh, I'm doing this project about women in sport, and I know this. I'm photographing this girl called Brittany, and um, and she's short statured." And she said, "Oh, my sister, she's got a little boy who's short statured." And I went, "Oh, okay." And then um, in the background, the project with First Peoples. Uh, disability network is is just bubbling away, and um, and uh, and and I thought, wow, when the time is right, this is going to be the story. <laughs> All right. Well, it was certainly good to. Uh, it's great to have you up, and uh, you took some amazing shots uh, with that little fella, and uh, quite a number of us in the family. Yarika, what are your thoughts on uh, on this sort of thing? What does it do for the likes of Quaden, for people with uh, disabilities, people with achondroplasia? How do you feel about it? Well, first of all, like I said in the interview, it's just been a great experience um, just to sit down and hear your viewpoint, to sit down and hear Quaden Senior and the twins, you know, being big sisters, just seeing how it's affected you know, a whole family, it's impacted, not in a negative way, although at first I saw it that way, but, um, you know, I really don't see my son as having a disability or a rare genetic disease as it's um, classed or known as. But, you know, this is just a really great opportunity, so I really thank um, Belinda and her beautiful boys for coming up and for being with for that stepping stone. I really believe it's going to be the beginning of something strong to come, you know. It's just a great opportunity to be able to get our story told and with telling our stories, you know, it brings about education on the issue, especially of Indigenous disabilities, um, because it's so prominent in our communities, like you mentioned. And, you know, with being able to share, you know, our culture is all about sharing and caring, that brings about awareness and with awareness comes respect. So hopefully, you know, my goal is just to be able to share with people what exactly achondroplasia dwarfism is and that they're really no different. I mean, they, they'll be made to feel different all their lives because they're so small and they've got a few different um, features than us. But, you know, I just really want to make his life as easy as possible. So just by trying to tell our story and educate people about this condition is, is all I can do to be able to help make his life easier. And with Belinda and her boys' help, it's just made it a lot easier. It's been a great start. Yes, it's certainly another angle that you would never have thought of that you might be engaged in or involved in to help promote better understanding, uh, 
and more awareness of disabilities in our own communities, let alone our own families. Yeah. Very good. Liam, anything you want to add or want to say along the way with about your experiences, um, this project? Um, well, I've experienced um, disability a lot in my life, so it's, it's always great to see all new aspects of it. Um, I always enjoy that. Um, yeah, I just love travelling with my mum and love to see new stories and I feel very privileged to be able to be a part of this. You yes, certainly are, young boy, very privileged. There's um, too many mainstream Australians live and die without ever making contact with my people, without ever having them tell you their story, tell you the story of place and what the different meanings of a certain um, aspects of our lives are and stuff. You know, you're very privileged. There's no question about that. And it's good to see you, uh, you see it in that way. That's great. You know, can I just add, sorry to butt in, the twins, when we got oh, driving home last night, we just had the most amazing conversation and it was very encouraging. I said, you know what, that's going to be us one day. You know, we can be like Belinda and her two boys. We can travel, tell our story, capture stories, and that's our dream, to travel around Australia and do what you guys are doing, you know. Like, it's great that you were able to do it and it gives us so much encouragement, um, inspiration and motivation to be able to continue from our perspective. So... He's really um, instilled something great in me and the twins and, and, and our family. That is good. So, Belinda, today um, you would like to hear from anybody out there that does want to make a call um, to, take, to tell more people's stories. That can be done if they call 0414-787-788. 0414-787-788. You can call Belinda Mason if you want to. Uh, be involved in a project, I'm this not, project. I'm the one who's lucky. I'm the one who gets to travel into these people's lives, the diversity of people, I, and, and be privileged enough to be able to hear their stories. Um, I, I'm definitely the one that's lucky to have met your family. Well, it works both ways. We're fortunate to be able to tell our story, and the little, the little man there, as you can see, he's a he's a he, um, he's a special little man in our lives. That bloke, young Quaden, it's great to be able to have the opportunity to meet up with yourself and have this exhibition going around. Have you work on this sort of stuff? It's amazing work. Where to? From uh, you took a number of shots yesterday, and it was it was interesting. I thought it was it was more than interesting. It was quite kind of quirky. You've got us all, like, um, there's about six of us in the family standing around, and, uh, well, you've had to take me shorts off, you reckon? <laughs> to show I'm me naked, legs. No. Yeah. You'll have to show our... And we had to show our legs. <laughs> and you've got Quaden standing at about knee height, because he's a, he's a, he's a little fella. Um, and it was kind of quirky where he's in, in the, the focus is on him, but all the legs around him. And there's well, some shots where his hands are up in the air, or he's looking up and, and trying to get up. Reach heights, um, the silhouette. It's, oh yeah, well, I can see where these awards come from, just the, what you were doing yesterday with that camera and see the results. It's just fantastic. It's great. So uh, it, it was a good experience, the, the, the shoot yesterday, with this little fella and all these black legs behind him. Yeah, yeah. I like it because the legs look like trees, and the trees is the grounding to the earth. And that the, the, the hand that's just coming down, that's waving because it's just moved so fast, that there's, it's just that slightly out of focus, which shows the tenderness in the hand, that you know that that movement is a tender one, and that he's reaching up, his mother's touching him and he's reaching up towards his father. And the expression on his face, he's not, it's a strong expression, it's not a smile and it's not a, it's, it, it, he's not crying, which he didn't, it was fantastic. Um, and you can see his absolutely gorgeous hair. Um, that's what I like. I like the strength, the family that in it, because everybody's legs were there. Everybody was there because everybody is there for him. He's got such a strong, um, committed family. And that's, and that's why, you know, it really, it, I like to take photographs that reflect somebody's journey. And when the boys interview them, I get the opportunity to hear that story and then just translate all of those emotions into a photograph. And I hope that I hope that I have done that. 
done well. I should clarify why I took my shirts, shorts off because they were long shorts or short longs. They come down near my ankles and I had my boxes on underneath. So rather than roll these things all the way up, I think it was easier just to drop them. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, an obscene shot or anything like that, you know, but we were all fully clothed. So I should just clarify that. Let people know I had to take my shorts yeah, off. Yeah, we all had clothes shoot. on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although it looks like yes. we're... But um, it was great, the legs, just those bare legs um, and nothing else there, just the young quote in front. Well, guys, um, it's probably come to an end of the program. Where to for you? You're going to see Yami Lester um, and uh, the young young noble over in the West. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and Jandamara. And Jandamara. Now, the, the kids went to school with Jandamara. He went to school here yeah, the Murray school. at the Murray School. So um, they, all, they grew up together and went to school together for some years here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, well, we're quite okay. close to the family. Yes, quite close. So good luck with your travels. Thanks for coming in. And we're looking forward to uh, this. will be on show at the United Nations in September we're, next year. We're really hoping that, that it will happen. It will definitely be a part, of the, um, a part of the conference. And we're hoping that they'll give us full gallery space. And that's all being negotiated at the moment. Fantastic. Well, keep up the great work. It's good to uh, have you in, in the studio live to tell the story and uh, particularly highlighting disabilities in the First Nations communities. Um, and the way you're able to capture it and, and tell these stories is just fantastic. Thanks, Belinda, and thank you to Liam. You keep, you keep up the good work, young fellow, because uh, you're well on the way, well on the way to, to being the journalist that you aspire to be. And, uh, and the multimedia thing, that's the thing these days. You guys are, are capturing... That, the essence of multimedia and making digital stories and telling and allowing people to tell their stories and stuff. So, uh, and you, Liam, are teaching other young First Nations people. That's fantastic. So you can't get much. Uh, you, you, you can't get a lot of criticism thrown at you because of what you do. Because you, you're giving. You're giving back. You're learning along the way. There's two way learning. You're giving back. Um, mate, you're in a very fortunate position and you, you know that, that was great and uh, thanks a lot for coming in both of you thank you thank and you sure. better thank uh, Big Brother when you see him too for being I a part of it all yeah alright thanks a lot guys have a great day thank and you and we'll talk again along the way I'm sure we might have to go over to Geneva to see the, to, for the launch of this show yeah.